All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I love a good expectant hush. That's, that's the lecture dream, right? Um, welcome to day two of our Groundswell Women of Land Art Symposium. I'm Anna Smith, Curator of Education for the Nasher Sculpture Center. We're so pleased to be here at Fair Park, right next to Patricia Johansson's monumental Fair Park Lagoon sculptures. Special thanks to our friends at Fair Park First for hosting us today. Our focus this afternoon will be the relationship between land art and public art. We will begin with a conversation between Groundswell catalog contributor and director and curator Suzanne lemberg Ustan Gallery at Bennington College, Ann Thompson, and exhibition artist Patricia Johansson. We'll take a brief, uh, excuse me, we'll take a brief break after that and reconvene for a presentation from Erica Doss, who is the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History, Distinguished Chair in Art History at the University of Texas at Dallas. Afterwards, we'll hear from curator Lee Arnold and brave the humidity to take a self-guided walking tour of Fair Park Lagoon. I certainly hope that nobody here was foolish enough to wear a wool blazer. Um, for anyone wanting longer bios of our presenters today, you can do so um, on our event page of our website, and there'll be a QR that comes up um, in the brochure that you can get to those information items too as well. I also want to give you the obligatory reminder to silence your phones before we begin. I know we're in for a rich and thoughtful program this afternoon, so please join me in welcoming, welcoming Patricia Johansson and Ann Thompson. I think we have to we have to talk into these. Um, hi, thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor for me to be in conversation with Patricia. And before we get started, I, I just want to acknowledge that Patricia, since the 1980s, has been a pioneer in ecological art and has done projects all over the country, all over the world, that are multifunctional civil engineering projects that have functional Components, yes, functional components, but also solve problems such as rebalancing ecosystems, and then also our public artworks in their own right. And so she's had this long career, but for the purposes of our conversation, we're going to sort of go back in time, and we're going to talk about a 20-year segment starting in the 60s before that rich career in ecological art got started. So the image that I, we're looking at first is the moment in 1967-68 when Patricia shifted her practice from being a minimalist painter to taking her work outside. Do you want to say something about Stephen Long? Well, <clears throat> I began as a, a minimalist painter, and my paintings got longer and longer. So they were using actual space. And I reached, th this one was painted in a warehouse in New York. Um, they were all about visual perception. People had to walk to see them. And so it dealt with the body in motion, not just looking the way you look at a traditional painting. They were also um, objects in space, and so they diminished perspectively. And people could, uh, could decide where they would stand, and they would see something different because there were spots in the painting. So they would be going off in different directions. I wanted to do longer paintings, and I got the idea that I would just do a long line outside. There was one previous to this in 1966. This particular one is Stephen Long. It's 1,600 feet long. And it was um, put on an abandoned railroad bed in upstate New York, and you can see me riding on the truck with the, with the plywood. And basically it was a color experiment and it came out of all of my studies in painting and color theorists like Chevrolet and, uh, you know, and, and um, other Leonardo da Vinci. And what happened here were all of those theories were put into action. And so the red, yellow, and blue, the primaries, would mix along the border. At sunset, when red light fell on the sculpture, the yellow would be orange, the blue, blue would be purple. Um, atmospheric perspective would fade out, you know, Leonardo would fade out the end of the sculpture. And of course, people would walk it. They would walk all along it to see it. Um, and so the reason I have these pictures is the local TV station uh, sent their crew out with a helicopter. And they filmed it, and it appeared it appeared on Walter Cronkite's Evening News. And, 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 and in motion, by the way, the helicopter flying all over. And so this 
It was then picked up by Vogue magazine and put into People Are Talking About. And so that really led to the next project. Um, somebody saw, saw the, the image in Vogue and called me up and said, would you like to design a garden? And I said, I don't know anything about gardens. He said, that's all right. He said, we want your kind of garden. And so that's how the whole House and Garden Commission came to be. Yeah, this is an image of the letter that um, the landscape architect, who is a consultant for House and Garden, sent to Patricia. And the thing that resulted that's so extraordinary was you were, you were asked to make a garden, basically, for a sort of chic, minimalist garden for a wealthy person's <laughs> home. Yes. And instead, you produced what is now the, the kind of legendary House and Garden Commission. Instead of designing one garden for one property, you made 150 drawings for possible gardens and wrote seven essays in, in categories of garden that are listed up here, gardens by the mile, um, vanishing point gardens, the artificial garden, illusory garden, the water gardens, and gardens for highway and garden cities. And um, I, we can't look at all of these gardens or all of these drawings, but to give a flavor, Patricia, you're thinking about what a garden could be and what art could be in the landscape was so far ahead of what people were thinking about. It anticipates Rosalind Krauss's art in the, um, sculpture in the expanded field by like 10 years. and and I'm wondering sort of what you were thinking about that led you to take the project in such an, an innovative direction. Well, I started out doing gardens that could easily be built in, uh, in, on some estate. And they were the line gardens. Um, and they were very simple. They could have been built. What House and Garden wanted was they wanted to actually build one of these gardens. And by the way, they all are buildable. People look at my work and they think it's fantasy. And in one sense, it is. But every, everything I design can be built. Um, and even though it, these are just schematic drawings, I put the notes on the drawings so that, so that the intention is clear. Um, basically, I wanted multifunctional projects. And I, want, I thought there was so much space that wasn't used um, in the way it could be. And of course, at this point, because it was house and garden, I was oriented to parks, but the only parks I knew were Olmsted parks, uh, which are basically English landscape gardening. Um, but here is a garden for a highway, and it has sheep grazing all over, but it's also art as entertainment. Uh, people can come and interact with the sheep, and instead of just having these embankments of useless space, you have something living and mowing the lawn, so you don't have to maintain it. The, uh, and the other one yeah. is, is also interesting. I, I, I was thinking of Philadelphia. That's actually Philadelphia. It's a scale drawing. And what I, what I proposed there are these alleys of trees that are quite wide. And as the wind, Philadelphia is a pretty hot city, as, as the wind passes over these trees, it brings all of the cool air into downtown Philadelphia. And so it's really, it's really climate control as well. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that. This, this drawing is just one of many that anticipates things that we're talking about right now, Anthropocene crisis issues from flooding to extreme weather, um, global warming. In this next slide, the image on the left is from the House and Garden Commission. It's a um, building that cleans, that cleans its own water. But the image on the right is from the New York Times six days ago. And that's as, uh, there was a feature about, this, about Singapore and what Singapore is doing with plantings and architecture to cool the city by 10 degrees. That's the goal, which is actually what's happening in this drawing specifically for Philadelphia it cools the city, but it makes the city 10 degrees cooler. Um, some of the other themes that are happening that are so interesting in these drawings is you're thinking a lot about the... You want to Can I just talk? Absolutely. Talk for yeah, of course. Th this is actually a very urban project. It's for New York City. And basically what I did was I closed off one block and made... Those are climbing walls. So it's a different kind of park. It's a vertical... They're vertical slopes that go down. And that's, that is a specific skyscraper. 
in the background, and that circular thing is a building covered with vegetation. But the idea was that you would create more park space. And of course, at this point, Mayor Lindsay was in, in New York, and he, he, uh, he applauded things like that. You know, he actually could have, could have and might have done it, uh, but he didn't last as a politician, so anyway. One of the things that is really evident in the house and garden drawings is you're thinking, well, you're thinking about many things, but the role of the viewer and the physical body of the viewer. And I was wondering if you could talk about these two drawings, which are sort of approaching the idea of the human body, but in very different ways. Well, the, the, um, I, I don't, don't remember the, oh, sorry. The, the one on the, the one on the left is the line garden, the breath of trees. And it's the idea where the viewer is basically creating the work for themselves from where they're yeah. standing. But basically, this was another climate control project where you would, the, the pathways would be up in the canopy of the trees where it's much cooler than on the ground. And so that was, again, I did a park for the rain, Amazon rainforest and it was a vertical garden. It went up 150 feet. Um, it was really quite wonderful and they wanted to build it, but unfortunately, my husband died, I had three children, I had to come back. And, but I think they may still build it because they actually gave me the land so that nobody could ever take it away. And so this is for the uh, Brazilian Amazon. And the whole idea of vertical stratification is again, the visual perception is changing, but everything is changing. The, there are layered animals as you go up. You know, you start out on the ground with snakes and things like that, and as you go higher, you get the sloths hanging in the trees, and, uh, and as you go higher, you get the harpy eagles that are hunting monkeys uh, that are trying to evade them, and so the great clatter swinging through the trees, uh, and the harpy eagle will pick one off. Uh, and this is, the Amazon is only one, there are only two places in the world that have these birds. They're quite, they're quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's about this parks on not just flat, not just horizontal, but the vertical stratification of them and how the temperature changes and the animals changes and the ecosystem change. You have bromeliads hanging in the trees and they have little cups and they gather water and within those little cups there's a whole world. You know, there are little, there, it, there are whole little ecosystems. There are little insects, and then there are little things eating the insects. You know, and they, and, and and they're they're nourished by the debris that's falling down from above them. That's where the nutrients come from. The other one um, is called the Secret Life of Paths, and I think you can see it's a brain, and it's about ways of perception. Uh, but I started out thinking about only visual perception. But then I, was, I wanted whole body perception. When, when you think about it, when you go out into the landscape and you're navigating through it, you're not just looking at things. All kinds of sensory information is coming in. Uh, you're hearing things, you're smelling things. Um, there, there's a lot going on around you. And then there are a lot of things you don't see because there are many, many creatures that are there and they have their own paths, but you don't see them because, for example, we don't have ultraviolet vision um, and, and, and other things as well. And so if you, if you read the drawing, people can access the, all of these paths and they can discover the different animals and the different ways of intuiting it. Another theme I want to talk about is how many of the drawings are invested in making industrial systems or processes visible, things that might be unpleasant, that we don't want to see or ignore. Yeah. Well, well, again, this has deeply to do with ecology. And in a way, we humans want to weed out all the things we, we like from the things we don't like. So we kill all the things we don't like, and then all you have left is usually the top tier animal that, that can't survive because you've, you've taken you know, his, his, his 
whole development away from him. His food is gone. Usually his habitat is gone. Um, and so uh, one of the things I, I try to stress in my work is that everything is neither good nor bad. Uh, that you, but you do need to include it all. And you don't want something that's dangerous. You don't want something that's poisonous. But on the other hand, you can't, you can't eliminate all the parts you don't like. The, the toxic rainbow is really Stephen Long. And again, it was the first image that was shown. Again, it's the primary colors. And uh, they're, they're, the toxins, this is a river that I used to drive by every day. And it had many industrial factories. And some days you would be driving by, and the water would be iridescent blue. And you'd say, oh, that's so beautiful. I, you know, I would stop and look at it. And then you'd see all the dead fish floating on top because the factory had dumped their chemicals in the water. And they, it was cheaper for them to pay a fine to the EPA than to, you know, have their waste removed uh, by truck. And so this is, again, interacting with nature. What you're getting there are the flow patterns of water interacting with the colors. And so you're actually seeing the patterns of the water, but you're seeing the poisons too. And then the other one is a slaughterhouse. And basically it's a waterfall of blood coming down uh, and going out into the garden uh, with, with the hands, um, like Macbeth, blood on your hands. And it's not that I'm saying don't do it. I'm saying you need to know what you do. Uh, you know, you need to have an awareness of what's, what's happening. And, and then you make your decisions about what you want to do. So when you started making these drawings, you were already starting to separate a little bit from the New York art scene. I remember that, I, I won't quote you correctly, I know, but I know at some point in your notes you wrote about how contemporary art doesn't say anything real. It's not dealing with things that had kind of stakes and it wasn't meaningful. And, and you had a gallery in the city, you were really poised for mm -hmm. a, traditional, a traditional path when you started making these drawings and went another direction. But I wanna also talk about you were friends with many people in the art world and that was still your community. And there are drawings in the House and Garden series that are, there's like a drawing for Matisse and there's one for Van Gogh. So, so artists obviously from art history, but also living artists. And so the drawing on the left is for Bob, Robert Smithson, and the drawing on the right is for Georgia, Georgia O'Keeffe. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your relationship to these artists. So basically, when I graduated from college, all of the people that you know today were not in the art history books. They were drinking at Max's Kansas City. And, and so I did too, although it didn't work as well for me as them. But, but I did know Smithson very well and Nancy. And um, one of the things I used to complain to him about was how destructive his work was. You know, when you think, this is called Garden of Sulfur and Tar for Bob. And Bob was doing things like asphalt rundown, where he would hire a truck filled with hot asphalt and pour it down the side of a hill. I think he did that at Cornell University. And, um, you know, and then there was the buried woodshed, you know, where he just collapsed something. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, Bob, you ought to think more about what you're doing. This is very destructive and it's not, you know, it, it, may, it may be cutting edge, but in a way, it's only for publicity in art magazines. You know, what are you adding to the world? And so this, this little butterfly is a very poisonous butterfly. Um, it's a long-winged butterfly from Central America. And, um, and it's the sulfur and it's the tar. And they're pools of tar. And the yellow is the sulfur. And basically what the, what the, what the drawing says on it is this garden should never be built. And, and I sent it to him. Because he was doing the asphalt pours and also the glue pour that happened in Vancouver for Lucy Lepard's show, really like at the same time you were doing this project. They're coincident, they're at the same time. Um, so this is, well, we won't see house and garden drawings for, for a minute, we're gonna look at something else. You, um, do you wanna talk about George? Oh yeah, sure, go ahead, <laughs> sorry. 
<laughs> Don't want to so, give her short shrift. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so I didn't have any money, so I became an art researcher and, and worked by the hour at different libraries in New York. And um, one of, I, I became very friendly with the librarians. And one day, one of them said to me, would you like to work for Georgia O'Keeffe? And I said, oh, yes, because I was somebody who, you know, really wanted to be with artists. And so I met her, and she said, can you come back to Abiquiu with me? And I did. And it was absolutely wonderful, because here was a woman in her 70s. She had been very famous. When I met her, she was, people had forgotten about her. She had left New York. She was now living in the desert. She was still painting, but she was considered very old hat. She, you know, this was the era of abstract expressionists, huge paintings, abstract paintings. She was still painting little barns and little mountains and little deserts, and they were very small. So you'd go into the Whitney Museum, and there would be these great abstract canvases, and then one of George's little paintings would be sitting there. And it, you know, and nobody was interested. Nobody was interested in Georgia. And she, Alfred Stieglitz had said to her, if you want people to recognize you, you need to wear the same outfit every day. And so she had her little black costume that she would always get out when she would, she didn't wear that at home. But I mean, she actually loved fashion. She had closets full of clothes and shoes. But she would get out and the, and the hem would go up and down depending on what the, what the Vogue was. And she would walk through the streets of New York with me. And we would go to all the art museums and people would look at her and they would know she was somebody, but they wouldn't know who she was. And, and so she was a very anonymous person at that point. And this is one of the gardens that I made that was dedicated to her, the Black Garden. I'm glad you told that story. I didn't mean to skip over Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, I want to talk about after you finished the House and Garden series, the commission, and just so everyone knows, House and Garden didn't publish any of this. They wanted nothing to do with it. Did they, did they say anything to you or even respond? No, nothing. You, I mean, James, the architect who, commissioned, who originally approached you, he was really excited about the work, well, right? Well, he yeah. was, but the, but the editorial staff was not. Right. And that's how all, so many gardens were made. I started out with the very simple ones that were very buildable, you know, could certainly have gone on somebody's estate. But um, I, I, he kept saying, oh, they're wonderful. Make 10 more. And so I'd make 10 more. We'd meet for lunch. And he'd look at them and say, oh, they're really great. Make 10 more. Because the, he knew that House and Garden, he was showing them, were not going to publish any of them. This wasn't their idea of what they wanted. They wanted a sculpture in the landscape, a DeSouvero, you know, a Henry Moore with the grass under it, you know, they weren't really interested in ideas, they were interested in fashion. And I was not interested in fashion, I was interested in ideas. Um, and that's how that so many of these drawings were made. And the next thing that you did after House and Garden is, is Cyrus Field, which is basically in your backyard. Yes. Yeah, and is still there. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the transition from the drawing to this sculpture and? Yes, Cyrus Field was a completely ecological sculpture. I was looking at the landscape and I was getting materials that worked with the landscape. And what I was really interested, and you can see the shadows, that's marble. Um, I got 70 tons of marble. They were building the Albany Mall at that time. And I heard they had a reject clause in the contract. And this enabled them to charge much more for the marble that they were selling to New York State. And they were shipping the rejects. And why would you reject a piece of marble? They were going on skyscrapers. You know, They were basically slabs of marble with little dowel holes in them at the end. You know, And uh, there, it, there was no reason. It was just a boondoggle. And so I discovered there were 70 tons of marble in the marble yards at Proctor. And I had a Guggenheim Fellowship. So I, I finally had maybe around $13,000 or something. And I went to Proctor and asked if I could buy it. And they said yes. And they charged me about $3,000 and trucked it all down. And basically, um, we hand carried these 
pieces into the woods on pallets, uh, really kind of primitive construction. We made pallets with you know, four handles. I hi hired three enthusiastic teenagers, and we hand carried every piece into the woods. When I surveyed for these projects, no trees were removed. And so a lot, most of the effort went into the surveying, particularly the marble piece. It has five lines of marble. And what I do is start with the first one and start with the second one, and then I'd hit a tree. And so I'd, I'd see what I needed to do to avoid that tree, and then I'd go back and start surveying again. And eventually, after a couple of days, I got to the point where we didn't need to take any trees out. And so the whole idea was, in, this is a, a, I think of it as a framework. It's not obliterating nature. It's there, it's very big, uh, it's meant to be walked through, it's meant for people to discover nature, but n nothing is removed. It is, and it is transforming. It is transforming through time. And that was the whole idea. That's the redwood today with the lichen and the moss. And a lot of the sections, again, it's very site specific. So if you're in an area where there's no tree cover, the whole sculpture is covered with moss. But if you're in an area where there is tree cover, then, then you get the lichens, you know, which prefer dry. Um, the animals have moved in under the sculpture because they're, they're floating. They're set up on, on pipes. And, uh, and again, this, this was the whole aesthetic. They reflect the world. And you can see the imprints of the, they're like fossil imprints on the, on the marble. And so basically they were in the woods. Um, I forget how long they are. They're very big. They're not small. It, it would take you a couple of hours to walk through them. Uh, they're very large configurations. And one of them is actually something you can see. Now here it's autumn and this is the pine forest. The redwood is gathering the pine needles. And so, again, they reflect the seasons, um, you know, and, and, and the marble at, by moonlight is fantastic, you know. And so those were the kinds of issues I was getting. All the animals are still there. You will find it when it snows, you'll find footprints of the deer and everything else that's been through there. They're all still living there. Nothing's, no, nothing's been removed. And you can oh. see how the mar how that redwood was bending around the tree. I mean, we really didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about drawing and and your intention that all of the house and garden drawings are propositions for things that could actually be built, because many of them. This is just one like the the kind of the blood garden from the slaughterhouse, or this one, which is called um, like fire fountain, right, seem quite fantastical, like follies. And, and I always sort of think of them with things like this Klaus Oldenburg sculpture, which is probably never going to be built, maybe someday, but for this kind of inflatable good humor bar on Park Avenue, and then the bite in the good humor bar is where the cars would drive through. But, but there's a real difference between your drawing, which is seemingly fantastical, and this other drawing that is not necessarily designed to be built. Like when architects and designers with drawings just kind of go nuts and have lots of fun with it, but knowing that it's never gonna kind of come into reality. And, and I was wondering if you could talk a little. When we talked this morning, you were saying that all of the house and garden drawings come from something that you'd actually seen. It's yes. from your experience. Yes, so the fire fountain in the 19th century <coughs> at Yosemite National Park, uh, what they used to do, they, they they had tourist bungalows, and they would come, and they would stay. And at night, people would go up to the top of Bridal Veil Falls, and they would, they would have a little you know, boat and fill it with oil, and they'd push it over the falls. And as it would fall, the water would, again, pull it into, and it was on fire. So you would see this, the whole cliff of Yosemite lit up by this sparkling fire that was falling down from high up. And I, I thought, wow, that's a really interesting idea. And, and so this, this is the same thing. It's, it's, these, it's the fire falling down over various levels of the fountain. So it's a pretty traditional fountain um, in one way, but not in another way. <laughs> 
So your first, the first opportunity that you had to actually bring ideas from house and, from house and garden drawings from the commission into reality is happen here. Um, and so this is, this is a picture of the lagoon after Patricia's sculpture has been built, but I think it's a really great picture because you can see the buildings, well, we're sitting in one of them, but the buildings that one was the Dallas Museum of Art and the other was the Museum of Natural History, which was the context for the lagoon. The lagoon was in front of these buildings. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what, what was the lagoon like? What was, this, what was this site like when you were invited to come think about how, how sculpture could transform the site? You know, I think when Harry Parker invited me to come, I, I believe what the director he was thinking of the of museum then yeah. was that the Mark de Suvero that had been in front of the Dallas Museum of Art was going to be removed and it was going to go down, downtown. And so I think what was really in his mind is that I would do something to replace that. Um, but I, I was really confused. I, I was surprised. When I got here, I said, well, what other artists are involved? And he said, just you. And I said, well, what do you want? And he said, this is Dallas. Do anything you want to do. And, and, and he said, and if they like it, they'll build it. And I thought, wow, nobody's ever said that to me before. <laughs> you know. And so basically, he, he said, do you think you can do anything with our old mud hole? And the truth was, it was covered with algae. Um, it, it, it was, um, there was nothing living in it, uh, nothing. And um, two boys, two days before I got here, had fallen into the lagoon and drowned. Because it was very, you know, and what happened was the, the younger child uh, decided to walk in and his feet got caught in the mud. And he sunk down and his brother went in to rescue him and then he sunk down too. And so I was looking at it as a, as a hazard, you know, as something that was ecologically um, not right. And I was also looking at it as, um, as, as a cultural thing, because I, I'm an artist. When I'm asked to do something, people do expect art. And so I was looking, looking at the whole context. And I think, I think Harry was quite shocked when I presented this. But he didn't say no. He said, I think it's wonderful. And, 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 uh, and then they did that show. Well, let's here, let's look at the drawings that you presented. These drawings are in, in the Groundswell show at the Nashar, but um, these are some of the initial, the first drawings. Well, these, these are just schematic drawings. These, these are the only drawings they had to show to raise money for the project. And the first one, Sagittaria platyphylla, is designed basically to halt the shoreline erosion. The North Shore uh, was eroding at the rate of eight inches a year. The banks were falling into the water, creating a lot of turbidity. Um, and so basically, if you look at that tangle of paths, somebody, somebody wrote about it as the spaghetti explosion, which I love. I mean, you know, so if you look at that tangle of paths, what that actually does is it breaks the water up again and again so that the wave action never reaches the back of the lagoon. And then if you look at that, that top leaf, you can see it follows the island. That's, that's a bulwark. And basically, uh, that's, that's uh, bank armoring. And it, it prevents, again, the, wa the, uh, the erosion on the, on the shore. The two islands that are green were meant to be animal islands, but they weren't constructed properly. Um, somebody, somebody constructed them as art instead of what I intended. And so basically, that would have been habitat. But for animal islands, you need a gradual slope going down into the water. You can't just go straight down because you need, it's like a handicap ramp. You need to, the ducks need something to climb up on and then they get to the island. And so they were not constructed properly. But, um, so that's that one and there was step seating. And then the other one. Is it okay to look at the model too? Oh yeah, yeah. look at the model. Yeah. Uh, this is the, this is Terrace Multifida. And um, that, that's my youngest child sitting next to a ceramic model. I made many, many models of this. And I, made, I liked the ceramic models because I could fill them with real water. And I wanted to see the reflections. I was really interested 
in all of these billiard shots. Not, you know, not just the drawing, but what was actually going to happen in terms of the color. And, uh, and the second model is a more conventional chipboard model that was made basically to show to funders. And uh, that is a huge model. Uh, it's, uh, it's probably half the size of, the size of that table over there. And it's lost, right? And if it's anyone lost. knows where this model is. It's lost. Basically, <laughs> when, when architects and artists make models, you ship them around. Anybody who wants them, that's fine. They have a, they have a meeting. You know, you don't know who's at it. They serve coffee and cake or something, and people come in. They look at the model, and maybe they'll contribute some money. And so that was the whole intent of the chipboard model. It looked like something that was more, you know, my models look like an artist's model, but the chipboard model looked like an architect's model, yeah. which was much more reassuring. And, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. And so the original intent of the firm was that they would all be arch bridges. But there was a little problem. Uh, San Jacinto Day was coming up, and this had to be finished. The sculpture had to be finished by then. Harry explained it to me. What he told me, he said, this is more important than the 4th of July. And he said, and George Bush is coming here, and he's going to make a speech on your sculpture. <laughs> and he said, so it needs to be finished. <laughs> and so the construction was cut short, and the arch bridges went, uh, and we ended up with something that was pretty flat. Um, and that, this is another Sagittarius model without the water. That was a problem, too. Can we talk a little bit about what you're bringing up here, which is the, the, comprom the kind of compromises that had to happen in order to bring this project into fruition? Because the, what was so interesting to me was the, the kind of the reason that this whole thing started happening was because um, a very civic-minded person named Bobette Higgins wanted to have an ecological conference. And in order to have this conference and to get the money for the conference, she needed to get all of the cultural institutions in Dallas on board. So she invited the Natural History Museum and the DMA, and then Harry invited Patricia as sort of their part, part of this conference. And this is a brochure for the conference, and then there's a picture of Patricia in the newspaper. And, and, and then as the result of the conference, and you had made the models and money was raised, but in the process of raising the money, some things happened to, <laughs> this, <laughs> to the sculpture that, that weren't necessarily as it intended to be. And obviously it was built and here it is. Well, you know, no, no public work of art is pure. And, uh, and that's probably true of most of us. And, and so I, I've learned that you never get 100% of what you want. And I think we did pretty well on balance. It, it, is a, it could have been a lot better. But on the other hand, the basic outline is there. You have all of the microhabitats between the paths that are breaking up the shoreline erosion. Um, where the fern is, I mean, you have places where you can sit. Those leaves along the shore are step seating. Uh, the fern has some benches in it. It's got the pond cypress trees in the middle. And, and basically, all of the animals have migrated in. And, and so I, I feel pretty good about it today. When, when I went to the opening, I was about to burst into tears because um, my mind was still in the mode of the ideal artist. You know, Greek sculpture, Renaissance, uh, you know, paintings, you know, Sistine ceiling, all of that. You know, it has to be perfect. But public art is never perfect, and in a way it shouldn't be, because public art is going to transform in time, as it should. It's like a person. You're born, you get older, you toddle around for a while, you know, suddenly you're a teenager and doing other things, then you're middle-aged, then you're dead. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and that's the way public art is. And in a way, if you're going to do an ecological project, that's the way it's always going to be. It's never going to be the same twice. It's going to transform in every possible way, with the weather, with the seasons, uh, in, in time. It's going to age, it's going to fade, you know, it's going to get chipped. But if it's a good project, it's not going to matter. It's like the Statue of Liberty when they renewed it uh, for the great Fourth of July celebration. It was falling apart. But nobody was going to let that go, you know. 
And so they completely renovated it. And that's what happens with public art that's loved. If people love it, they will step in and defend it. And you have to defend it because if there's a fair swath of territory, somebody always has an idea for how they could use it better. Um, you know, and, and so I'm very happy that people seem to like Fair Park and all my other projects so much. And that's intentional, I want that. That's, that's what's most important to me. I wanna show a few images that we talked about that show how ideas in house and garden show up in the Fair Park Lagoon sculpture. So, so this image, um, mutable garden snake butterfly has to do with the reflections that the shapes make in the water. I'm gonna go through these sort of quickly. Yeah, it, uh, has, it actually has to do, and, and Dallas is a perfect example. Uh, when I got here and took some pictures, the, we had had a huge thunderstorm the night before, and the water was over the sculpture. And the woman who was writing about it was very upset. She said, oh, you know, I said, no, no, that's the way it's supposed to be. It's a flood basin. You know, I said, it'll go down. You know, a flood basin releases the water slowly. It doesn't dump it all into the creek, you know, in 10 minutes. That's the whole idea. Um, and so... And that same idea is in this drawing also, the Tidal Gardens. Yes, Which yes. is also about making, like, a kind of amphitheater, sort of spectator place for people to sit and watch. Yes, yes. Yeah. Basically, this is the same thing. The lower, the lower parts will flood with water, but the upper part, which is on higher ground, won't. And there's kind of an amphitheater back there. And I always try to put something in that people can actually use as a gathering space, as a seating space, to observe nature. I mean, you know, you, people, when you're out walking around, everybody gets tired. And so I've learned that a few benches are a good idea. Um, but uh, they, they don't look, mine don't look like benches, they look like part of the sculpture. And color also is important. Yes, yes. This, I'm sorry, there's one picture that's not here. I have one picture that shows the color mixing on the sculpture very clearly. Because the paths are topographical, the lower points gather water. And when they gather water, you get these puddles, irregularly shaped puddles. And what happens then is if you get a nice sunny day, you get a rainstorm, they fill with water. People step around them. Uh, if you get a nice sunny day and have a blue sky overhead, you get a purple puddle. And the reason you do is because the blue sky is mixing with the terracotta of the ground. And so you're seeing purple, but it's really not there. Those were the microhabitats that we just went by. That, that's something else. All of, those, all of those little interstices were developed um, in conjunction with the Dallas Museum of Natural History. And we targeted specific animals, and some, some quite small, like, you know, fairy shrimp and things like that. But the entire project is, you know, we may talk, of, talk about it as landscaping, but it's actually a food chain or a food web. And so everything out there is edible. Everything out there is there either because it's nesting materials or because it's food. And this is why you have the animals. And here are some of them. And yeah. here we have a nest on the top. And on the bottom we have the cypress knees coming up and some mallards who you can see have made the, uh, that part of the shore very bare because that's what they like. And then you can see a legion of turtles on the sculpture. Because bef before, when the water was so contaminated and covered with algae, like birds wouldn't come to the lagoon because they couldn't land on the water because it was so, it just basically was, remember you sort of saying it was not a magical place, but there really, there was no animal life there, really. No, nothing. Yeah. Nothing. It was, I mean, the, the Dallas Museum of Natural History declared it biologically dead. And, and so basically you had maybe some algae you know, which they didn't want. You had very murky water because of the erosion. All of this sediment was washing into the lagoon every time it rained. And so the solution to that was the littoral zone. I think you have a picture of it. Might be the next one, I'm not sure. I don't. Yeah, where, where that man is showing his son the plants, that's all along the shoreline of the lagoon. And that's called um, L-I-T-T-O-R-A-L, a literal zone. 
and it's two or three feet of plants. And what those plants do is they filter the water. If there's any runoff from the lawn or anything else, it gets trapped there. And on the roots of many plants live microbes, and they really do the heavy lifting. The plants filter, the microbes eat. And so this, whenever you see any plant with a great big root, it's covered with microbes. And so things like iris are very good. I use them all the time uh, because that's what you want. And here, you know, this is an, a very early shot when the plants hadn't grown up so much and people running along the paths. Now, I want to say one more thing about the paths. Um, I, I have children. I don't design dangerous things. They may look dangerous. They're not. What is actually under the paths that go, I think, maybe four feet out on either side is a, what, a little continental shelf, just like our oceans have. They, you, they, you, they don't just drop down. They go down gradually. And so it was interesting at the, at the, uh, the night of the Lagoon Fiesta, when it was uh, about to be dedicated, everybody was drinking and falling into the lagoon. <laughs> But they got right out, and they were, they were happy, they were laughing, like, oh, it was so funny that I fell into the lagoon and got wet. But, you know, you don't want people drowning on your art, you know. <laughs> I want to end with this image because then we want to leave time for people to ask you questions. I'm sure people have them. But I'm so interested in these two pictures. The picture on the left is a kind of architectural glamour shot of the, of the sculpture, and it's on the cover of a, of a really amazing book about Patricia's work. But the picture, that's the picture on the left, but the picture on the right is a picture of the exact same same part of the sculpture that you took, Patricia, and it's of a family like looking for turtles. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, when I when I came to Fair Park with this woman who was writing an article, I mean, we, we both look. We were not dressed appropriately for Texas, and we both were looking around. People could see that we were kind of tourists, and so this this man came over to us and said, "Can I give you a tour? We come every Saturday, and we know this very well." and and I said, oh, oh, thank you. And he said, would you, he said, would you like to see the turtles? And I said, yes. <laughs> and so there he is. He's, he knew where every turtle lived in the lagoon. And his children had named them all. And what he's going to do there is he's leaning over, and he's pulling out a 60-year-old snapping turtle. And he threw it up on the path. And the thing... <laughs> <laughs> wasn't happy, uh, but you, you know it was actually quite wonderful to see that somebody, you know, knew where every turtle was, and he told me. Uh, uh. I think we should open it up for questions. I think we've got like ten minutes for questions, Patricia. Cyrus Field. Cyrus Field was the person, an American who laid the transit, transatlantic cable. And what that project is, it looks like patterns, but it's actually a long continuous line that goes for three miles. And so basically, I was very interested, you know, I'm an Americanist. I'm interested in American history. And Cyrus Field actually lived in Pittsfield, Vermont. Uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and I was just very interested in him, and, and, and I'm always interested in the process, what they go through, how they, how they accomplish these things, because if you're doing something for the first time, there's no manual. You have to figure out how to do it, and so that's why I named it Cyrus Field. The, my, Stephen Long, you know, is also uh, an explorer. All of my projects are named after people like that. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to work in Dallas as opposed to other American cities? Oh, I'd be happy to. <laughs> I would be happy to. I mean, I love Dallas so much. And part of the reason is nobody, even today, would build a project like this 
they would not raise the money because they would not be getting enough back for it. It's a, this particular project is so much in the public interest. It's so much about bringing, let it, letting children have access to nature and discovering themselves what they're interested in. I have no agenda. I just try to put it out there and let people find their own interests. Um, but I mean, today I do very big projects, but they're always hinged on infrastructure. And so yeah, they're giving $150 million, but they want something for it. They want a sewer, they want a dam, you know? And so that's where all the money goes. I try to get as much art, as much habitat into all my projects as I can. And every one of them is filled with plants and animals. Uh, and they all, basically what I'm trying to do is reconnect all the disconnected uh, systems that we have now. Because nobody ever thought about that this way. And the reason we have problems is because the systems are disconnected. I mean, I, I have actually driven on highways uh, behind roadkill trucks. And basically they come out early in the morning and they've got a truck heaped with dead bodies and they're throwing deer and things into the back of the truck. And basically, if they had paid attention to the migratory corridors, they wouldn't be doing that because everybody knows where these animals cross. That's why you see deer crossing, you know. And so if you just accommodated the animals, you wouldn't have to spend the money picking up their dead bodies. And so that's the kind of thoughtfulness I'm looking for. You know, yeah, you can still have all the things you want, but think about it. You know, that's what I'm saying to, to, um, to Smithson, is think about the consequences of what you're doing. You know, it's not just a picture in an art magazine. I was just curious about, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, defending public art and preservation of this project, if you knew of any efforts uh, towards that, or if you've seen any strategies with your other projects, like if we should start a Friends of the Lagoon organization or something to keep uh, dinosaurs out of it. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not a purist, in case you can't tell. I mean, I, I don't um, eliminate things because I want a perfect world. I want a complete world. I want a connected world. I want a world that functions, functions well. Uh, functionality is the key issue for me. If it doesn't function well, it's not gonna be beautiful. If it becomes an obstruction or an eyesore or whatever, who's gonna love it? Everybody's gonna hate it. They want it, want it carted away. It's like the Richard Serra project in Manhattan where he blocked the entrance to, between a subway and an office building. And people suddenly had to walk around this 250 foot long sculpture. And they didn't want to do it. This, the, he put a wall in people's path. And my idea is, no, you don't, you don't put walls in people's paths. You let them choose their own, you put enough paths in so they can pick their own path and let them discover their own interests. But, um, you know, uh, I don't know what to say. I, I love the dinosaurs, I love big text. <laughs> You know, I'm all for it. I mean, what, what's the harm? You know, I'm not doing Greek sculpture. <laughs> I'm not living in an ideal world. So yesterday you had mentioned um, when you were asked about drawing and you said that your work was just scribbles. Yes. And when I look at them, they're fabulous and they're descriptive and they're beautiful and I want to actually see them created. So I know that those were from 1969. How has your work changed and who do you work with now and who's assisting you? Because um, you're working on these huge um, valued projects. Yes. Well, <clears throat> one of the recent projects that was completed was this dam. It's on the Utah Registry of Dams in Salt Lake City. And they've had a flooding problem. The flooding, when they built I-80 and the access roads to I-80, um, they, they didn't consider the creek. They actually took the creek off its original course and dog-legged it under the highway and then brought it back and then dog-legged it again. And so the creek isn't happy about that. 
And so what happens is, it, uh, at certain times of the year, the spring, when you get a lot of snow in the Wasatch Mountains and you get a heavy rainstorm, it all comes down at once. And it goes into the park, into Sugar House Park, and it overflows onto the highway. And when it does that, the highway becomes a conduit and takes it all the way down to Temple Square. And they have to sandbag the road. And so this happened when I was there. There were, the manhole covers were popping off and fish were jumping out. And you know, the guy I was working with said, oh, it happens all the time. And I thought, well, it doesn't have to happen all the time. And so we had your typical engineers. Look, I went to architecture school. My father was an engineer. I love them. I love, I wanted to be an engineer, but you know, <laughs> I, I, I didn't. Everybody advised against it that I wouldn't be able to get a job. Um, but, but the thing is, uh, we had these very traditional engineers, I won't mention them, and they designed a huge like concrete dam, like the Hoover Dam, right in this park. And I'm looking at it and saying, you don't need to do that. You know, well, they made a few other mistakes and they got fired, which is very rare. Engineers rarely get fired, no matter what they do. And so now we went to the second bunch of engineers, and I made this drawing of this Sega lily, and I said, look, you can leave the creek on the path, and you can let the water come up, and when it reaches a certain height, it will breach the dam, breach the detention basin, go down the stem of the Sega lily, and this big petal will turn the water, It'll go under the eight lanes of traffic, goes down a spillway with flood walls, and go back into the creek. And that is the original path of the creek. And on top of that, I was very interested in the Mormon history. And so the flood walls and the spillway are actually modeled on Echo Canyon, which is where the pioneers came through when they were on their way to cross the mountains. And there are so many you know, journals and they write, the, the Mormons are really very good uh, conservationists. And the reason is Brigham Young told them, as they brought wagon train after wagon train through, you can only kill the animals you're going to eat. You can't just slaughter them for fun. And they were very interested in frogs because, and that's why I've done uh, projects called the Voices of Frogs. They knew that if you if a frog was living in the water, they could drink the water. And there were a lot of uh, poisonous springs uh, on the path. And so there were certain things that they knew. And I was very interested in all of that lore. Um, I, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but. <laughs> no, but. That's Ask okay. again. <laughs> uh, no, but, but um, well, I think where I was going as somebody who has a background in landscape architecture is, you know, in your current team who makes that up? Do you have a landscape architect that you work with? Um, oh, I see. Yeah. <clears throat> well, when I design a project, <clears throat> what I try to do is get the public on my side. And so well, I worked with the engineering team on the value engineering project. I was one of the consultants, the artist. Um, <clears throat> and so Nobody was kind of listening to me, but I was there, and I knew what their thinking was. And I did, there were seven alternatives. I did the seventh alternative, and it was a natural systems alternative. And what we did was we went down to City Hall, and we presented it to the council members and the public at large. And not surprisingly, they liked my project much better than they liked the engineering project, which was the dam that cut everything off. And so, basically, the, these people went down uh, to the, the local park there, and they collected 5,000 signatures in one weekend. And they brought them to the city council, and basically what they said is, we want the seventh version. We don't want these other alternatives. <clears throat> and basically, the other alternatives were all mechanical systems. You know, and the difference would be maybe one would have a methane recovery system, and you know, one would have uh, a different biosolids uh, uh, treatment. But, but in the end, what I wanted for this particular uh, project was for it to just function naturally, you know, 
uh, and that the water would go back into the creek. And so uh, basically, they, they picked my alternative. Did I answer your question now? <laughs> yes. OK. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Just one more, and it was. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if uh, it's really interesting to me that you worked uh, for Georgia O'Keeffe really early in your career, who also did not consider herself to be a feminist and pushed back against that label. Um, I'm wondering if you could sort of talk about what it means to you to be part of a peer group of all women um, in relation to this show, or how do you see yourself within this, this um, history that, that does ultimately classify you as some sort of a feminist? Well, you know, basically, I'm, ha I'm very happy to be in the show. It's, it's not that. But I, I don't like the idea that people are excluded. And if you think about, you know, history, there are always people and groups out there telling you what you can think and what you can't think. And so yesterday, you know, when I was more or less attacked by five feminists, <laughs> uh, you know, for saying I wasn't a feminist, I just thought, well, okay, that's your opinion, but I'm not, I'm not gonna change because you're putting political pressure on me. You know, this is what I really believe. I believe in the whole world. I don't believe, you know, uh, th these are political processes. That's all it's about, you know. That's all it's about is, is, is women getting some attention. But I'm more interested in, is your art good? You know, and I'm inclusive. I want to include the whole, the whole world. I don't want this group or that group. I think one of the things that's wrong today is we've splintered. We're not a cohesive, cohesive Americans anymore. And we need to get that back where we're all on the same page, you know, where we're all together again. And, you know, I just see, you know, when, when people say I need to be a feminist, I see the Third Reich, I see China. You know, I'll be really honest about that. That's what I see. You're telling me what I can say and what I can't say because you don't want me offering a counter view. And I'm going to offer a counter view. Well, you know, I, I think what you do <clears throat> is you work with whatever you're given. And that's what I do with infrastructure projects. I'm not looking for the ideal world. <clears throat> I'm looking for what I can do with what I'm given. And so I consider it a great advantage that I was never a law to artist because that's not what I want to be. I was never interested in money. I was never interested in fame. I, I didn't care if I was ever in an art book at all. And so that was fine. I just kept working and I kept my vision. If I had gone with a gallery, they would be telling me what to paint. I can't tell you how many friends of mine uh, became members of a gallery and then they started selling their paintings and the dealer would say, oh, we want more of these. Don't make those, nobody likes those. And so I wanted to be an independent thinker and um, I, I, don't, I don't know if you're a I'm answering your question, but you know, it's obvious I am a woman and it's obvious that I've had those experiences, but I, I'm not resentful. I'm not angry. I don't feel as though the world has been bad to me. I, honestly, I feel very lucky uh, that I've been able to do what I do. And I'm not looking to set one group against another. Thank you so much, Patricia. It's been an honor to be in conversation with you, and thank you so much for all your answers and for your beautiful work. So we're gonna take a 10-minute break. There are some refreshments over here, and then we're going to reconvene um, for Erica Doss's presentation on public art and land art. Thank you, everyone.